the fullness of time. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul, Paul tells us Jesus came in the fullness of time, when time was full. And Christ is going to come again when time is full. Would you say amen to that? I'm going to begin with a quote from Dr. George Knight. And this message today has to do with Ellen G. White. Maybe you didn't know that and you said, oh my, what's he going to talk about? I want you to listen carefully. I was going to put an outline together for you and I realized I better be careful. I've got too much to say and too little time. But that's all right. If I were the devil, I would tempt Seventh-day Adventists and their preachers to just be nice evangelicals. Forget such nasty stuff as apocalyptic. And if that didn't work, I would tempt them to beastly preaching that focused on the details and the extremes. I would get them arguing over 666, the identity of the 144,000. If that would not succeed, I would get them to focus on excitement and apocalyptic fear-mongering. Either the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been called by God as a unique church, but that's all right. If I were the devil, I would tempt Seventh-day Adventists and their preachers to just be nice evangelicals, forget such nasty stuff as apocalyptic. And if that didn't work, I would tempt them to beastly preaching that focused on the details and the extremes. I would get them arguing over 666, the identity of the 144,000. If that would not succeed, I would get them to focus on excitement and apocalyptic fear-mongering. Either the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been called by God as a unique church, or let's roll up our tents and go home. Did you hear that? If this church is just another church, it's not an apocalyptic, prophetic church, then let's just roll up our tents and go home. Why waste your time here? Hold up your Bible for just a moment, would you please? If I preach within the framework of the everlasting word of God, are you okay with that? It's when I divert and I sidetrack and I give my own opinion. Then you can question me. I'm not a doomsday preacher, but I'm a realist. And I want to tell you again, we are on the verge of Canaan land. We are going home. This is not our home. That's why you have trouble. Do you think it's a strange thing? I can hardly walk still after a month and a half. It's not strange. The devil doesn't like the truth. And I am a preacher of truth. Would you agree with that? I've been here since October. Do I preach the word of God to you? I hope you love me as much when I leave today as you do now. I believe you will. In the book of Joel, the Bible talks about the pouring out of his spirit in the last days. Don read that text. I will pour out my spirit in old flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servant and my what? Maid servants. Okay? If you were to lay the Bible open to Acts chapter 2, 17 17 to verse 21, and chapter 28 to 32, you would notice that just before the end of time, God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit again. The early pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church saw in a 17-year-old woman the fulfillment of Joel, where the prophet tells of God pouring out his Spirit on men's servants and maid servants. Is this promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as well as dreams? Is it true? Joel said it is. 
The New Testament gift of prophecy is listed among those gifts to be present in the church until the second coming of Jesus. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you have the word of God and you're there before me and someone has it there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Now the testimony of Jesus undergirds the spirit of prophecy. It is built on the testimony of Jesus. So I would expect that Ellen White was a gospel writer. How many of you would say amen to that? Her book, Desire of Ages, is in the Hall of Congress. The number one book in America on the life of Christ. The number one from a woman who had very little education. She had her first vision December 30th, 1844. That's really interesting. December 30th, when? 1844. I'm going to explain it in just a minute. So you, you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus. When you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, turn over there and we'll read another couple of verses. I hope you're not going to rush me today. Is that okay? My wife said, honey, be slow. You tend to put a lot of material together. I would rather have you over-informed than under-informed. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. This is talking about gifts. If you read the whole list, I've held spiritual gift seminars now for, since 1978. How long is that? I've had church growth seminars. I have a full seminar on the spiritual gifts of the Bible. I wrote a Bible study based upon that. I'll make it available to some of you in the future. I'm just fine-tuning it. A complete set of studies in the life of Christ. All the truth in the life of Jesus. Verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts? And yet I show you a more excellent way. And of course, that's the excellent way of love. What's the top gift? Every single gift mentioned, the prophet is the top gift. Hold your hand up. If I can stand up without falling over, hold up your hand. The apostle represents the thumb. He's got his thumb on the work. The prophet's the finger pointer. Are you with me? Evangelism, the longest one of your fingers is to reach out to the lost. The ring finger is a pastoral gift of connecting the bride with the bridegroom. And the little finger is the gift of teaching. Smallest of gifts reach the greatest of hearts. How do you like that? That will help you remember a little bit, right? All right. How does God use the gift of prophecy? How has God used the gift of prophecy at critical times in history of his people? God is consistent. Ecclesiastes chapter 315, note this. Can you all see this? Can you? All right, I want to make sure you can see it. I, I'm doing my best. You know, I was going to do slides, but I agree with Jack sometimes. Take the word of God. Amen? All right, here it is. How God uses the gift of prophecy at critical time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and what verse? 15. What does the Bible say? That which is has what? Already been. And that which is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is the past. What has happened is already done. What is done has already happened. In other words, not everything new is true, and not everything true is new. Boy, did you catch that? Oh, my, we're on a roll this morning, are we not? All right, I'm going to journey through this, and... uh, I'm going to, in just a moment, give you some principles here. 
Paul insists the church become behind in no gift, and that includes the gift of prophecy. In fact, the gifts of prophecy, as I mentioned, is at the top of the spiritual gift list. So I want to look at how God used the gift of prophecy at critical times in the history of his people. I'm going to show you from the Word of God how God is consistent and the Bible never fails. And the prophetic gift is used not only in the past, but today. All right, let me come over here and not fall down here. I'm okay, don't worry. God gives a direct or indirect time prophecy through his spokesman or spokesperson, often women, Toward the end of the fulfillment of the time prophecy, God raises another person, prophet, with a prophetic gift, to apply the time prophecy to his generation. Oh, this is good. Say, this is good. God gives a prophet toward the end of the time prophecy. He raises a prophet who applies what that prophet said. Oh, I like that, Rocky. Thank you. Number three, this application of prophecy creates a remnant who are faithful to the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The word is given by the Holy Spirit of Christ, 1 Peter 1.10 and 12. Take your Bible, turn there with me to 1 Peter 1.10. 1 Peter 1 and verse 10. Oh, I love this scripture, my dear friends. Scripture is so important to us. Would you say amen to that? Oh, how I love the Word of God. I know you do too. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. I was talking with a man one day, and he was downing what I was teaching about the gift of prophecy. And so I responded by saying, evidently, you've never read the Word. I know the Bible. I said, well, let me show you something. And I showed him what I'm showing you. And do you know what that pastor said? Well, I'll be... 1 Peter 1.10. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired, search carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what, or what manner of time, ah, there it is, time, the Spirit of Christ who was in them, indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed, listen to this, not to themselves, but to us who were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look. Amen. They desire to look into what I'm going to share with you today. When we get to heaven, my brothers and sisters, we are going to have a celebration. I mean a celebration. Would you say amen? amen. Oh, yes. That long table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, my. By the way, let's continue with this. Number four. This concept of a person giving a time prophecy and another spokesperson applying the prophecy is seen in Four periods of time. Four epochs. If you have a pencil and a paper, take it out. You're going to want to do this. I have it in the flyleaf of my Bible. I have an outline of it. And uh, it's here. It's old. I wrote this message a while ago. But I've, it's never failed. How many of you have a pencil and paper? You ready? You ready? Okay. Four periods of time. Enoch, listen to this, prophesies to the person of his son, Methuselah. The name Methuselah means... Oh, you've got to catch this one. This is really good. When he dies, what? You got it? When he dies, it will be sent, literally Hebrew. When he dies, he's like an arrow. When he dies, it will happen. When he dies, it will happen. Methuselah died what? Oh, I didn't put it up there. Year of the flood. Are you with me? Say, I'm with you. Don't miss this. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. 
And what did Noah do? He applied the prophecy of Methuselah. The very day, built an ark, and the very day the flood came, Methuselah died. When he dies, it will happen. One prophet applying another prophet. Are you with me? I want to make sure you're listening to me, please. If I get too far ahead, just raise your hand. Because I'm teaching here. And by the way, Methuselah taught his family to reverence the commandments of God and Jesus Christ. Remember? The Spirit of Christ was in them. The Spirit of Christ was in them. So he taught the law of God, the everlasting gospel. And what did Noah do? The Bible says Noah found what? Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Say amen to that. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to this. It's beautiful. Hebrews chapter 11. Down there at the end, I want you to read with me. Hebrews chapter 11. And listen what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 11. Come on, I know you're there. <laughs> I have my text. Let me see if I can find my text here. I've got it. I've got it. Talking about Noah. My faith. Did you find a text about Noah? Ah, verse 7. I thought it was verse 7. All right, read it with me. By faith, by what? You know what faith is? Hold your hand up again. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all I trust H, him. Faith. Forsaking all I trust him. Everything else is going to pass away but him. Amen? And what did Noah have? He had faith. Would you build an ark of gopher wood, which was a wood we don't even understand today. Very hard. Give a call for 120 years and end up with a harvest of eight people. That's not much of a harvest, is it? A remnant was saved. But we don't know how many were saved during the 120 years of preaching. Say amen. We do not know how many were saved. So Noah applied this. Ah, let me give you the second one. Let me come to the second one. I'm behind in my notes, so I want to stay with this. I want to make sure that you're with me. I better sit down before I get too restless. (laughs) Number two. The second epoch of time. Abraham prophesied in Genesis 15, 12 to 16 that Judah, Israel, would spend 400 years in captivity. 400 years. Let's read that together. Genesis 15. Please take those and turn with me. Genesis chapter 15. If you have that, and you'd like to read it so I don't get wore out with my voice, raise your hand. Huh? We have a mic, Ray, if you'd bring that. This is so important. Uh, Wes has got one, too. I want you to be involved in this. Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. Who's going to read it? Over here, Paula said she would read it. Do you mind doing it this way? You get feedback from one another. Here it is. Genesis 15, 12 through 14. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions." Listen to this. Abraham prophesies. Now I want you to catch this. If we're true to the first one, he prophesies, and toward the end of the fulfillment of the 400 years, God has another spokesman who will apply the prophecy of Abraham. Oh, does he? Well, let's see. Moses in Exodus chapter 12. Turn there with me. Exodus chapter 12, 
Verse 41. Who's going to read verse 41? I want you to be real loud if you're going to read it. Exodus 12, verse 41. You have a volunteer? I can read it. I just would like to get you involved a little bit. Exodus 12 and verse 41. Okay. Okay, read it nice and loud. Nice and loud for us. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Is that verse 41? Okay, and now what does the last part of the verse say? The armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Are you with me? That day. They went that day. Well, he applied it, didn't he? Was there a remnant? Oh, my. 600,000 men, plus women and children. God redeemed them. He took them out of Egypt on the way to the Canaan land. Just like God is doing with you and me, taking us out of a world of sin, bringing us into his canopy of grace. Amen. Well, let's continue. I separated these a little. Okay, coming out of Egypt the very self same day. Number three, Jeremiah prophesies that Israel will go into captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah 25, 10, and 11. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 10 and 11. If we have somebody, I'll let you read. If not, I'll read it. Jeremiah chapter 25. All right here, this uh, dear sister is willing to read right here. Jeremiah 25, 10, and 11. Please read it. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. How many years? 70 years. That's 10 sabbatical years. 10 times 7. Every seventh year was a year of sabbatical. The Israelites were to leave the land untilled. But Bible prophecy seems to indicate they never really kept the year of Jubilee or the sabbatical year. And by the way, we're going to talk about a prophecy of four to 90 years. That's 10 Jubilees. 10 sabbatical years, 10 Jubilee. But this is so important here. He prophesies Israel will go into captivity for 70 years. Listen to chapter 29, verse 10, as I read. But thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. I will visit you. How? Through a prophetic gift. For I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. All of Christianity today uses Jeremiah 29, 10, and 11 for you and me. For I know the hope God says I have for you. And some of us are not fulfilling that hope. We are caught up in Egypt with the leeks, the onions, and the garlic of Egypt. Ah, This is so good. Did Abraham keep the law of God? Write this text down. Jeremiah, uh, 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 Genesis rather, 26, 5. Abraham kept my laws and my commandment. Plus, when he offered Isaac, he gave a picture of the everlasting gospel, the testimony of Jesus. Amen? I love the Bible. I love the word of God. Toward the... uh, Let me get the other here. Myself situated. 
In Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul says, For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Toward the year of this period, let me make sure I'm on three. Uh, I'm a little behind. Catch up, Rocky. Seventy years of captivity. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. Don't miss this, my dear brothers and sisters. What I'm showing you is truth. Daniel 9, 1 and 2. Daniel 9, 1 and 2. And anyone like to read it? Right here, sister. Go ahead. See her right here? What? Oh, he's coming down. Daniel 9. Please read nice and loud, my dear sister. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Are you beginning to see a pattern here? God gives a prophecy. Toward the end of the prophecy, he raises another prophet to apply. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. This sister right down here would like to do it. Wes, raise your hand. Daniel 8, 14. And um, I'm going to have you read verse 27 as well, if you would. Daniel 8, 14. And And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Verse 27, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Now, if you read Daniel chapter 8 correctly, you will find that everything was understood by Daniel, except for this time prophecy. In verse 26, the Bible says the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told to you, Daniel, is true. Seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future. And what happens? In verse 27, he said, I'm astonished. I don't understand. The only thing he didn't understand was the time. That's all. And then Daniel begins to study. And I love what he said here. We're going to kind of go through this. I want you, if you have a question, please wait until I'm all done. Daniel 9, 24 through 27, 490 years. 457 B.C. to 34 A.D. The anointing of Jesus occurred when? A.D. what? 27. Who was the one that would apply the prophecy of Daniel to Jesus? Who? Who? John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. At the anointing of Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell like a dove from heaven, and the prophecy was applied. John was the forerunner. He understood his place. What did Jesus say in Matthew 1, 15? The time is fulfilled. I'm ready to do my ministry. The fullness of time has come. I'm ready to do my ministry. 490 years. Jesus dies three and a half years later in the middle of the 70th week. Don't come with this Antiochus stuff to me. That's a bunch of dispensationalism. Jesus died in the middle of the 70th week. What did he say? Seven weeks are given to him. He labored with his disciples for how long? Three and a half years. In the last three and a half years were given to the nation of Israel, and they fell, the city fell, under Titus, the Roman general. Are you beginning to see a picture here? Ah, but there's a second part to this. Daniel 8, verse 14. Under 200, 300 years, then the end of this time prophecy would be fulfilled. Uh, let me come back. I want you to read Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Let's do that while we're right here. I'm going to reiterate this, recapitulate it before you go home. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people for the holy city. Listen to this now. 
to finish the transgression, Jesus. To make an end of sins, Jesus. To make reconciliation for iniquity, Jesus. To bring in everlasting righteousness, Jesus. To seal up the vision and prophecy of the 2300 years because of hoarded nine years a part of it. And then, uh, to anoint the most holy place. Who did that? Jesus. You know, the Bible is not Israel-oriented. It is Messiah-centered. Everything is about Jesus. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for your learning that we, through power and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Amen. Towards the end of this 2300-year prophecy, listen to this. I don't have time to go into it all. I don't want to confuse you. God raised such men as William Miller, a farmer in New York State. I've been to his home. In fact, uh, let me not, I don't want to speed ahead of myself. Miller started believing in 1833 that the prophecy was coming to a conclusion. And they came from everywhere. He went to Boston Temple in Boston, so sold out, you couldn't find room. A country farmer from New England. He said, I'm going to take my Bible and the concordance, and I'm going to read it cover to cover until I understand it. And man, he did. I wonder if we've ever done even a part of that. When this old farmer stood up front, they knew it was not him speaking. It was God. And they used the text, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Amen? Go out to meet the bridegroom. And Miller, when left with his friends, so-called friends, he was not sure that 1844 was being fulfilled. You see, Miller believed the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14 was a destruction of the earth. But what it was about is God and the heavenly sanctuary. Remember when Jesus died? What happened to the temple veil? Rent from top to bottom. Only, only the Lord could do that. So the prophecy has two aspects. It was applied by God's people in 1833 all the way up to 1844, October 22nd, the end of the 2300-year prophecy. And what happened? In December the 30th, Ellen White had her first vision. December 30th, 1844, and she applied the 2300-year prophecy. She was God's spokesman. What do you think of that? She applied... Did she believe in the everlasting gospel? Give me a loud sound. Yes. Did she believe in the law of God? If you read her writings, is she a legalist? Uh, But, you know, here's something else. The fifth epoch. Ellen White had 2,000 dreams and visions. What does she say, and how shall we apply her writings? She speaks. You and I are the ones to apply. I love that, don't you? She speaks. And we are the ones to apply. And you say to yourself, well, I don't believe in her. You know, you can be a Seventh-day Adventist and not be convinced in the gift of prophecy. But do you mind me sharing what I believe? Raise your hand if it's okay. I find it hard to believe in the prophetic word of God by laying Ellen White aside. She said, I'm a lesser light. Never consider herself greater than the word of God. And there are prophets in the Bible who never wrote a book. Can you think of some? Yes. Elijah never wrote a book. John the Baptist, the greatest of prophets. We don't have his book. He's in the book of Jesus, right? And Ellen White wrote 2,000 dreams and visions. Let me summarize it for you. Do you mind? Listen to this. I'm going to try to come down so I don't fall here. But I have Wes next to me. I have surgery coming shortly. I want you to look right at me. I'm going to give it to you again in synops. Fast. All right? Enoch prophesies to the person of his son Methuselah. What does they mean? When he, die, when he dies, what? It shall happen. 
the very name. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. Methuselah died the year of the flood. And Noah applies that prophecy. And he builds an ark. Oh man, I love this. 120 years before the flood, God called Noah. Well, Methuselah is still with us, but when he dies, it will happen. Abraham, called by God, was told that his descendants would have a period of captivity for 400 years, and then God would bring them out of captivity. Through Abraham, God commanded the gift of prophecy concerning a time prophecy about God's people. Abraham kept the laws of God and was faithful to Jesus. God raised Moses to apply this time prophecy. And according to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 41, that same day, the fulfillment of the prime prophecy, they left. Jeremiah the prophet received the testimony of Jesus. And under the testimony of, the testimony of Jesus girds the gift of prophecy. It's not the gift of prophecy. It's the foundation of the gift of prophecy. Listen to this. He says that God's people are going into captivity for how many years? No, how many years? Seventy years. And then what happened? Daniel comes along. He's reading the book of Jeremiah, and the Lord says, You got it, man. Apply it to this generation. And he does. And then Daniel prophecy, the prophet is given a prophecy concerning God's people in truth. Daniel 8, 12, the question is asked, How long is this vision? And the answer is given in Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 years, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And John the Baptist is a forerunner of the first period of time. And William Miller and the bringing out of God's people out of error. And Ellen White. Well, she didn't found the church. God found the church. Would you say amen? He founded the church. She didn't want to be called a prophet. She said, I'm a handmaiden of the Lord. How many of you can see what I've shared today? Raise your hand if you see it. You got it. If you're a little foggy, we're going to recapitulate some. Here we are in 2000, what? 24. Boy, Jim, that's a long time. Well over 100 years. And Ellen White prophesied. She died in 1915, or up to her death, she prophesied. You know what she said? Here it is. Write it somewhere in your Bible or in your notes. Letter 12, 1890. And I'm going to close. She said, The very last deception of the devil, the very last deception of the devil, will be to make of none effect the, spirit, the spiritual testimonies of God. She would be under fire. You know how, how, how much she's under fire today? Many young preachers don't even use her. They don't believe her. But I want to tell you something. Number one, I'm glad that I'm pastoring your church. Amen? And I'm glad you're listening to truth. I hope you find it elsewhere. But what I've shared to you is from my heart. God loves you. He does. He loves you. I love you. You don't have to agree with me. But you should study this for yourself. I'm going to have an outline for you in the future. But you've heard the principles. How many would be willing to admit they are true? Raise your hands. Let me see your hands. There you go. There you go. All right, we're going to pray now, and I'm going to stay down here rather than come back up. I remember evangelistic meetings I had in New England, and a little church called the Berlin, New Hampshire Church. Oh, Berlin's beautiful, but not in the dead of winter. (laughs) Right in the White Mountains, you know, it's gorgeous. And uh, I was preaching afterward, this young man came up, and he asked me a question. Do you believe that Ellen White was a prophet? To which I respond, responded, do you believe that? He said, yes, I do. He said, but I talked to another Adventist minister, and he wasn't sure. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you for the Word of God. Oh, Father, how we love your Word. Open our minds, open our hearts. Help us to be heroes in these last days, dear God. To not shrink from the truth, but to confess the truth, proclaim the truth, live the truth. Lift up the truth. Be with our great controversy, Ad Father. And oh, Father God, how much we love you for giving Jesus, oh, oh, sweet Jesus, balm of Gilead, bright, the morning star, the fairest of 10,000. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, please take what I've shared this morning and bring it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.